the third century, the Roman Empire wrapped around the Mediterranean Sea like a scarf. Thinner on the North African coast, it bulked large as it enveloped what is today Spain, England, Wales, France, and Belgium, and then evened out along the southern coast of the Danube River, following that river eastward, taking in most of what is today called the Balkans, crossing the Hellespont and engulfing in its suite the territory of present-day Turkey, much of Syria, and all of modern Lebanon, Israel, and Egypt. All the regions but Italy comprised what the Romans called the provinces. This was the Roman Empire whose decline and fall was famously proclaimed by the 18th century historian Edward Gibbon, but in fact his verdict was misplaced. The empire was never livelier than at its reputed end. It is true that the old elites of the cities, especially of Rome itself, largely regretted the changes taking place around them. They were witnessing the end of their political, military, religious, economic, and cultural leadership which was passing to the provinces. But for the provincials this was in many ways a heady period, a long postponed coming of age. They did not regret that Emperor Diocletian divided the Roman Empire into four parts, each ruled by a different man. Called the Tetrarchy, the partition was tacit recognition of the importance of the provinces. Some did, however, regret losing their place in the sun, as happened 400 to 500, to people still farther afield, whom they called barbarians. In turn, the barbarians were glad to be the heirs of the Roman Empire, even as they contributed to its transformation. The Roman Empire was too large to be ruled by one man in one place, except in peacetime. This became clear during the crisis of the third century, when two different groups, from two different directions, bore down on the frontiers of the empire. From the north, beyond the Rhine and Danube rivers, came people the Romans called barbarians. From the east came the Persians. To contend with these attacks, the Roman government responded with wide-ranging reforms that brought new prominence to the provinces. Above all, the government expanded the army, setting up new crack mobile forces while reinforcing the standing army. Soldier workers set up new fortifications, cities ringed themselves with walls, farms gained lookout towers and fences. It was not easy to find enough recruits to man this newly expanded defensive system. Before the crisis, the legions had been largely self-perpetuating. Their soldiers, drawn mainly from local provincial families, had settled permanently along the borders and raised the sons who would make up the next generation of recruits. Now, however, this supply was dwindling, the birth rate was declining, and 252 to 267, an epidemic of smallpox ravaged the population further. Recruits would have to come from farther away, from Germania and elsewhere. In fact, long before this time, Germanic warriors had been regular members of Roman army units. They had done their stints and gone home. But in the third century, the Roman government reorganized the process. They settled Germanic and other barbarian groups within the empire, giving them land in return for military service. The term crisis of the third century refers not only to the wars that the empire had to fight on its borders, but also to a political succession crisis that saw more than 20 men claim, then lose with their lives, the title of emperor between the years 235 and 284. Most of these men were creatures of the army, chosen to rule by their troops. Competing emperors often wielded authority in different regions at the same time. They had little interest in the city of Rome, which in any case was too far from any of the fields of war to serve as military headquarters. For this reason, Emperor Maximian turned Milan into a new capital city, complete with an imperial palace, baths, walls, and circus. Soon other favored cities joined Milan in overshadowing Rome. The new army and the new imperial seats belonged to the provinces. The primacy of the provinces was further enhanced by the need to feed and supply the army. To meet its demand for ready money, the Roman government debased the currency, increasing the proportion of inferior metals to silver. While helpful in the short term, this policy produced severe inflation. Strapped for cash, the state increased taxes and used its power to requisition goods and services. To clothe the troops, it confiscated uniforms. To arm them, it set up weapons factories, staffed by artisans who were required to produce a regular quota for the state. Food for the army had to be produced and delivered. Here, too, the state depended on the labor of growers, bakers, and haulers. 
new taxes assessed on both land and individual heads were collected. The wealth and labor of the empire moved inexorably toward the provinces to the hot spots where armies were clashing. The whole empire, organized for war, became militarized. In about the middle of the third century, Emperor Gallienus forbade the senatorial aristocracy to lead the army. Tougher men from the ranks were promoted to command positions instead. It was no wonder that those men also became the emperors. They brought new provincial tastes and sensibilities to the very heart of the empire, as we shall see. Diocletian, a provincial from Dalmatia, brought the crisis under control, and Constantine from Moesia brought it to an end. For administrative purposes, Diocletian divided the empire into four parts, later reduced to two. Although the emperors who ruled these divisions were supposed to confer on all matters, the administrative division was a harbinger of things to come, when the eastern and western halves of the empire would go their separate ways. Meanwhile, the wars over imperial succession ceased with the establishment of Constantine's dynasty, and political stability put an end to the border wars. The empire of Constantine was meant to be the Roman Empire restored. Yet nothing could have been more different from the old Roman Empire. Constantine's rule marks the beginning of what historians call Late Antiquity, a period transformed by the culture and religion of the provinces. The province of Palestine had been in fact a hotbed of creative religious and social ideas around the beginning of what we now call the first millennium. Chafing under Roman domination, experimenting with new notions of morality and new ethical lifestyles, the Jews of Palestine gave birth to religious groups of breathtaking originality. One coalesced around Jesus. After his death, under the impetus of the Jew-turned-Christian Paul, a new and radical brand of monotheism under Jesus' name was actively preached to Gentiles not only in Palestine but also beyond. Its core belief was that men and women were saved by their faith in Jesus Christ. At first, Christianity was of nearly perfect indifference to elite Romans, who were devoted to the gods who had served them so well over years of conquest and prosperity. Nor did it attract many of the lower classes, who were still firmly rooted in old local religious traditions. The Romans had never insisted that the provincials whom they conquered give up their beliefs. They simply added official Roman gods into local pantheons. For most people, both rich and poor, the rich texture of religious life at the local level was both comfortable and satisfying. In dreams they encountered their personal gods who served them as guardians and friends. At home they found their household gods, evoking family ancestors. Outside on the street they visited temples and monuments to local gods, reminders of hometown pride. Here and there could be seen monuments to the divine emperor put up by rich town benefactors. Everyone engaged in the festivals of the public cults, whose ceremonies gave rhythm to the year. Paganism was thus at one and the same time, personal, familial, local, and imperial. But Christianity had its attractions too. Romans and other city dwellers of the middle class could never hope to become part of the educated upper crust. Christianity gave them dignity by substituting the elect for the elite. Education, long and expensive, was the ticket into Roman high society. Christians had their own solid, less expensive knowledge. It was the key to an even higher society. In the provinces, Christianity attracted men and women who had never been given the chance to feel truly Roman. The new religion was confident, hopeful, and universal. As the empire settled into an era of peaceful complacency in the second century, its hinterlands opened up to the influence of the center, and vice versa. Men and women, whose horizons in earlier times would have stretched no farther than their village, now took to the roads as traders. Uprooted from old traditions, they found comfort in small assemblies where they were welcomed as equals and where God was the same, no matter what region the members of the church hailed from. The Romans persecuted Christians, but at first only locally, sporadically, and above all in times of crisis. At such moments, the Romans feared that the gods were venting their wrath on the empire because Christians would not carry out the proper sacrifices. True, the Jews also refused to honor the Roman gods, but the Romans could usually tolerate Jewish practices as part of their particular cultural identity. Christians, however, claimed their god not only for themselves, but for all. 
Major official government persecutions of Christians began in the 250s with the 3rd century crisis. Meanwhile, the Christian community organized itself. By 304, on the eve of the promulgation of Diocletian's last great persecutory edict, when perhaps only 10% of the population was Christian, numerous churches dotted the imperial landscape. Each church was two-tiered. At the bottom were the people. Above them were the clergy. In turn, the clergy were supervised by their bishop, assisted by his presbyters, deacons, and lesser servitors. Some bishops were more important than others. No religion was better prepared for official recognition. This it received in 313, in the so-called Edict of Milan. Emperors Licinius and Constantine declared toleration for all the religions in the empire, so that whatever divinity is enthroned in heaven may be gracious and favorable to us. In fact, the edict helped Christians above all, they had been the ones persecuted, and now, in addition to enjoying the toleration declared in the edict, they regained their property. Constantine was the chief force behind the edict. It was issued just after his triumphant battle at the Milvian Bridge against his rival Emperor Maxentius in 312, a victory that he attributed to the God of the Christians. Constantine seems to have converted to Christianity. He certainly favored it, building and endowing church buildings, making sure that property was restored to churches that had been stripped during the persecutions, and giving priests special privileges. Under him, the ancient Greek city of Byzantium became a new Christian city, residence of emperors, and named for the emperor himself, Constantinople. The bishop of Constantinople became a patriarch, a super-bishop, equal to the bishops of Antioch and Alexandria, although not as important as the bishop of Rome. In one of the crowning measures of his career, Constantine called and then presided over the first ecumenical church council, the Council of Nicaea, in 325. There the assembled bishops hammered out some of the canon law and doctrines of the Christian church. After Constantine, it was simply a matter of time before most people considered it both good and expedient to convert. Though several emperors espoused heretical forms of Christianity and one professed paganism, the die had been cast. In a series of laws starting in 380 with the Edict of Thessalonica and continuing throughout his reign, Emperor Theodosius I declared that the form of Christianity determined at the Council of Nicaea applied to all Romans, and he outlawed all the old public and private cults. Christianity was now the official religion of the Roman Empire. In some places, Christian mobs took to smashing local pagan temples. In these ways, a fragile religion, hailing from one of the most backward of the provinces, triumphed everywhere in the Roman world. But Christianity was not simply one thing. In North Africa, Donatists fought bitterly with Catholics all through the fourth century, willingly killing and dying so that the lapsed might not hold ecclesiastical office again. As paganism gave way, Christian disagreements came to the fore. What was the nature of God? Where were God and the sacred to be found? How did God relate to humanity? In the fourth and fifth centuries, Christians fought with each other ever more vehemently over doctrine and over the location of the holy. The so-called church fathers were the victors in the battles over doctrine. Already in Constantine's day, St. Athanasius had led the challenge against the beliefs of the Christians next door. He called them Arians rather than Christians after the priest Arius, another Alexandrian, and a competing focus of local loyalties. Athanasius promoted his views at the Council of Nicaea and won. It is because of this that he is the Orthodox Catholic father and Arius is the heretic. For both Athanasius and Arius, God was triune, that is, three persons in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Their debate was about the nature of these persons. For the Arians, the Father was pure Godhead while the Son was created. Christ was therefore flesh, though not quite flesh, neither purely human nor purely divine, but mediating between the two. To Athanasius and the assembled bishops at Nicaea, this was heresy and a damnable faith. The Council of Nicaea wrote the party line, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, begotten not made, of one substance, homoousius with the Father. Arius was condemned and banished. His doctrine, however, persisted. It was the brand of Christianity that Ophila, 
a Gothic bishop with Roman connections, preached to the Goths along the Danube, at the same time translating the Bible into the Gothic language. Arianism was only the tip of the iceberg. Indeed, the period 350 to 450 might be called the era of competing doctrines. As church councils met, Monophysites held that the flesh that God had assumed as Christ was nevertheless divine. Eventually this view, which tended to assimilate human flesh to Christ's and thus divinize humankind, became the doctrine of the Armenian, Coptic, and Ethiopian Christian churches. On the other hand, Pelagius was interested less in the nature of Christ than in that of humanity. For him conversion bleached out sins, and thereafter people could follow God by their own will. Entirely opposite to Pelagius was St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo and the most influential Western churchman of his day. For Augustine human beings were capable of nothing good without God's grace working through them. Come, Lord, act upon us and rouse us up and call us back. Fire us, clutch us, let your sweet fragrance grow upon us. Doctrinal debates were carried on everywhere and with passion. Gregory of Nyssa reported that at Constantinople, if one asks anyone for change, he will discuss with you whether the sun is begotten or unbegotten. If you ask about the quality of bread, you will receive the answer, the father is greater, the son is less. If you suggest a bath is desirable, you will be told there was nothing before the son was created. Like arguments over sports teams today, these disputes were more than small talk. They identified people's loyalties. They also brought God down to earth. God had debased himself to take on human flesh. It was critical to know how he had done so and what that meant for the rest of humanity. For these huge questions, St. Augustine wrote most of the definitive answers for the West, though they were certainly modified and reworked over the centuries. In The City of God, a huge and sprawling work, he defined two cities, the earthly one in which our feet are planted, in which we are born, learn to read, marry, get old, and die, and the heavenly one on which our hearts and minds are fixed. The first, the city of man, is impermanent, subject to fire, war, famine, and sickness. The second, the city of God, is the opposite. Only there is true eternal happiness to be found. Yet the first, however imperfect, is where the institutions of society make possible the attainment of the second. Thus, if anyone accepts the present life in such a spirit that he uses it with the end in view of the city of God, such a man may without absurdity be called happy even now. In Augustine's hands, the old fixtures of the ancient world were reused and reoriented for a new Christian society. The city of man was fortunate. There God had instituted his church. Christ had said to Peter, the foremost of his apostles, Thou art Peter Petros, or rock in Greek, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. Although variously interpreted, no one doubted that this declaration confirmed that the all-important powers of binding and loosing sinners were in the hands of Christ's earthly heirs, the priests and bishops. In the Mass, the central liturgy of the earthly church, the bread and wine on the altar, became the body and blood of Christ, the Eucharist. Through the Mass, the faithful were joined to one another, to the souls of the dead, who were remembered in the liturgy, and to Christ himself. The Eucharist was one potent source of God's grace. There were others. Above all, there were certain people so beloved by God, so infused with his grace, that they were both models of virtue and powerful wonder workers. These were the saints. In the early church, the saints had largely been the martyrs, but martyrdom ended with Constantine. The new saints of the 4th and 5th centuries had to find ways to be martyrs even while alive. Like St. Simeon's stylites, they climbed tall pillars and stood there for decades. Or, like St. Antony, they entered tombs to fight, heroically and successfully with the demons. They were the athletes of Christ, greatly admired by the surrounding community. Purged of sin by their ascetic rigors, holy men and women offered compelling role models. Twelve-year-old Asella, born into Roman high society, was inspired by such models to remain a virgin. She shut herself off from the world in a tiny cell, where, as her admirer St. Jerome put it, fasting was her pleasure and hunger 
her refreshment. Beyond offering models of Christian virtue, the saints interceded with God on behalf of their neighbors and played social peacekeeper. Saint Athanasius told the story of Saint Antony. After years of solitude and asceticism, the saint emerged as if from some shrine, initiated into the mysteries and filled with God. When he saw the crowd awaiting him, he was not disturbed, nor did he rejoice to be greeted by so many people. Rather, he was wholly balanced, as if he were being navigated by the Word of God and existing in his natural state. Therefore, through Antony the Lord healed many of the suffering bodies of those present, and others he cleansed of demons. He gave Antony grace in speaking, and thus he comforted many who were grieved and reconciled into friendship, others who were quarreling. Healer of illnesses and of disputes, Antony brought spiritual, physical, and civic peace. This was power indeed. But who would control it? Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria laid claim to Antony's legacy by writing about it. Yet writing was only one way to appropriate and harness the power of the saints. When holy men and women died, their power lived on in their relics. Pious people knew this very well. They wanted access to these special dead. Rich and influential Romans got their own holy monopolies simply by moving saintly bones home with them. Men like St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, tried to make clergymen, not pious laypeople, the overseers of relics. Ambrose had the newly discovered relics of Saints Gervasius and Protasius moved from their original resting place into his newly built cathedral and buried under the altar, the focus of communal worship. In this way, he allied himself, his successors, and the whole Christian community of Milan with the power of those saints. But lay people continued to find private ways to keep precious bits of the saints near to them, as later reliquary lockets attest.